today I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Tom Vallee. Now Tom's family moved to Ross in 1961 just <laughs> as he started kindergarten. So he went through Ross School, Redwood High School, he went on to the University of California, Berkeley, where in 1980 he received an AB in Environmental Studies. Now Tom had been a volunteer for the Ross Fire Department starting in 1975. He became a paid fire captain in December 1981, was promoted to chief uh, from 2008 to 2012 when he retired. And that puts Tom in a very unusual category where over 50 years of his life is right here, either living and or working in the town of Ross. Not too many people can make that claim. Uh, Fred Massara would be one. The Aarons family. Bruce Selfridge is another one. So. Uh, it's a very, very small category, and we're thrilled to have Tom here today. So please welcome Tom Blue. That's for the Rotarians. Well, thank you all for uh, having me. This is what happens to you when you say, yeah, give me a call and let me think about that. And they just go ahead and put you on September 16th. So anyway, I'm going to try to get through this fairly quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on dates and, and um, events so much as more the community of Ross and how they've supported the fire department over the years and some of the kind of unique stories that it could only happen here in Ross. So let's see if I make this thing work. That's me. Better? All right. I'm sorry. This is... A, for everybody, this is Anna who, when we have questions and answers, is going to run around with a microphone because this is being recorded for the Marin Fire history. So um, if you see her come up to you when you ask a question, and I'll entertain questions whenever as long as we don't get too bogged down. All right, that's, that's me up there. That I put up just to compare to the old helmets that are here. If you get a chance, pick up an old helmet, which weighs, I don't know, a pound or so. The new ones are probably eight. So, notice, notice how clean that was? I, would, I didn't do anything as a chief. <laughs> That's me. Richard just stole that slide. Anyway, some of the early history. This uh, slide on, on the left there came up just um, what, about midweek here or last week. Um, it's a slide from Richard McLaren's collection. And nobody really knew what happened in the town of Ross before the 1910 engine. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But all of a sudden, this picture turns up of the, the horse-drawn team. And if you notice, um, the drivers are not in uniform everybody else is. Those were real Teamsters. And Bill Lellis was telling me, the ex-fire chief of Larkspur, that they used to pay the teams to come out and actually get the equipment to the fires. And so that's where the Teamsters came into also be part of the union and everything else as we went on. The second picture is unique. It's probably the first motorized fire engine on the West Coast. And once again, the town of Ross, as much as they did things backwards, had community backing and support. That was $5,500 in 1910. You can only imagine. And that came from a donation from a guy named uh, John Martin, whose greenhouse the volunteers saved or burned down. Nobody knows the whole story. Uh, but anyway, he donated the 5500 to buy that. So when they started in 1908, when they incorporated it, we're assuming now that was the horse cart because nobody else knows. Um, there's even questions about fire department. Did it really start the day of the town incorporation? Nobody even knows that for sure. Uh, earliest records I can find and have is 1918. So the corner, the first firehouse was over the corner where the school is. You guys all know it is Shady Lane. It was Woodworth's. If you get a chance in the old fire logs, you'll see there's no Shady Lane till the late 40s, early 50s. And there's also no numbers, we'll get to that. Everybody was a name, not a number. So um, then the first chemical engine and staffing, which I found finally, was, you can see, we were actually public safety before we were public safety. 
you had a, the paid fireman called the chief then, was the only paid person in the fire department. His assistant chief was the deputy constable who uh, relieved him when need be. He was hired to work six days a week, the fire chief. And quite honestly, the town would probably love to have that still happen um, because they used to work us a lot more hours than a lot of places. Um, and then the road uh, caretaker was the daytime guy. He would show up if they had a daytime alarm. So you can see the, the calls there, that what they paid on them. Well, look at how much we paid when we finally had our last volunteer. Really jumped that pay way up, you know. <laughs> so, like I said, the town has always been a little thrifty. I won't call them cheap. Actually, I can call them whatever I want. They can't fire me anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, this is a Shotwell property where the, we now exist, the firehouse is. They got that in 26, and uh, I believe they bought it real cheap. It was less than 50,000 bucks. And it was, it, if you've been on that entire property, it's a lot of acreage there. Um, typical, like everywhere else in this valley, where do they build firehouses and police departments? In the floodplain. So <laughs> Station 20 out in, in, uh, towards Sleepy Hollow is over the creek. Uh, anyway, I found out today I'm wrong on the additions. Uh, I found another piece of paper this morning, didn't change the slide. 36 is when the actual side residences got added at the firehouse. And I went back and looking that up because supposedly it was uh, a WPA project. And I, didn't, I found that not to be true because I found the contract with who did it. Okay, pride of ownership. The original uh, rules of the town called for a max of six firemen. And they had their, their clapper bells, and I'm not sure, maybe Bruce some point could talk to what a clapper bell is, but they were actually hardwired into their houses. So this sign, and it's here, is kind of unique. Pick it up if you want to see what uh, solid copper or copper clad brass weighs. It's unbelievable, but that hung till I left and I took it down because I knew somebody would part with it. Um, that upstairs room, and there's people in this uh, audience who know who they are, lots of things happened up in that room, but it was, it was almost like a private club, these guys. And they had a big pool table up there and lots of things went on up there. We won't get into that. But there was, it was very small. It wasn't like how it was in the 70s when we'd have 30, 35 volunteers who really kind of knew what they were doing, but not really. These guys really had a lot of pride in it. You'll see some of these pictures over here, coat and tie every year for their pictures and everything. We can, cannot say that during the 70s. Um, the fire alarm system. Once again, something very unique to the town of Ross at the time. I mean, they moved into their new firehouse by 28. They put in the fire alarm system in 28. The fire alarm system was 2,800 bucks. And those hard wires stretched all through town. And the old members of the community will remember that all the pool boxes were around. Well, they were there because there was no phone contact. So it used to be fun because there were a lot more false alarms and everything else. But um, they slowly disappeared. And they disappeared for a multitude of reasons, one being, obviously, everybody had a telephone. Um, the maintenance on them became huge. Bruce will tell you, you know, wintertime when the trees fall down, we'd be out finding the, uh, the broken lines. And uh, one year, I think it was mid-70s, we even restrung a whole bunch of it. And it just kind of shrunk and shrunk and shrunk till we finally ended up with box two, which was right on the front of the firehouse just for show. And it's the system still in over there, the horns, if uh, you remember, we're all, every box had a code, so the horns would blast the code, and that's where the volunteers ended up going. And then, of course, pagers came and everything else, so all this went away. But I'm hoping it, in due time, because uh, we really need a new firehouse over there for everybody or anybody who's ever been in it, it's literally falling down around the guys right now. And 
I hope they can keep that system in there just for a showpiece. It's still up on the wall in there. All the wheels are still there. Uh, they haven't had a battery on it for I don't know how long. And that's Chief Meager's problem back there when he didn't uh, keep it up after I left it in great shape. <laughs> so, yep. Also, uh, people who lived uh, in town for a number of years will remember that they blew the horn three times a day, 8 a.m., noon, and 5 p.m. Uh, it was up, up into the early 70s they were doing that. And uh, so, you know, you could kind of set your watch to that horn, but it would blow every day. I think Larkspur was probably one of the last that, that blew that at noon. We could we could hear it off in the distance, uh, not that long ago, being probably 30 years ago. But um, the system, you know, it blew the horn here in town every day. It was an automated system; nobody had to go out and physically do that. But it, uh, you know, it was something that was kind of you got used to around here. You know, you didn't jump. Um, I would jump in downtown San Samuel, and they blew it because. You know, you'd be walking down the middle of the street and the thing would blow at noon or something. But in Ross, they blew it three times a day, every day for probably, you know, 50 years. And we're going to blow it today at noon if it still works. <laughs> and that's assuming it doesn't fall over because the platform it's on is pretty rotten. <laughs> and now you guys all know now that it's, uh, it's a siren, right? You've all heard that on Saturday once a month. That tells you something's going on in town. There it is right there. And it's just a unique system. Uh, like I say, I hope they preserve it. it. Everything, this wheel of tape here, every time the horn blew, it'd punch a hole in the tape, and that was the record of the fires. So somewhere in that firehouse, I don't know where they are, they may even be gone, is a whole box of wheels of tape. And you can go back, and after... the Whatever the alarm was, the duty officer would write on there, this is where they went. Um, and <laughs> you can see, I mean, it, it looks like something out of a Frankenstein movie or something, but it, it does work. There's the, one of the old cards. I don't know if you guys noticed that other card real quick. Ever, anybody remember Dave Smith at Tam Electric? Yeah. yeah. He was a big friend of uh, several of the chiefs and also a friend of the fire department. And did a lot of lot of things for us. And he was also the building inspector as well. He was for a while, and uh, he was an easy building inspector. <laughs> All right, there's the uh, one thing I didn't mention real quick is um, the 1910 engine in 1911, and I've forgotten I'd given it to him because I couldn't find it. Is uh, the call over there, the San Francisco paper, and. Uh, the minister at the time at St. John's was being given a ride to show him the new fire engine. And unfortunately, they crashed into a tree on Bolinas Avenue and killed him. So it, it was a big headline in the San Francisco paper. So we, we do have stuff in Ross that we do cover up. But, so. Anyway, that's the 1927 Mac um, we found out this morning it's now in a uh, Fresno warehouse instead of where we left it in Vallejo. Um, so we got to find out about that. Uh, the, the volunteers still own it, the Volunteer Association. It's another one that has a, a great story just in that Bob Ford, another old name in this town, he bought it when they retired it in uh, the early 60s and then gave it back to the, the Volunteer Association and then also donated a whole ton of money to, to fix it up. Um, Bruce and his brother painted it down in the old Hutchinson's quarry. Um, so it's, it's got a history of its own. We're going to have to do a little more research there. Uh, this is the one I grew up on. Um, one of the sweetest driving fire engines around. I saw that two weeks ago. Yeah, it's, it's still owned by the guy, I believe, in Novato. Uh, the, in Healdsburg. Oh, it's in Healdsburg now? Well, okay. It's in Cloverdale now, but it's um, 50% ownership by a guy in Healdsburg and a, and a guy in Cloverdale. So, and the town of Ross, and there's some old council people here, so once again, I'll be careful. Uh, they could, I use an analogy, they used to trip over a $100 bill to pick up that shiny dime. And, you know, you go, how many years can you get out of a fire engine? Well, that one was in service till 82. 
so and and it you know it was kept well and everything else but it, the life is usually about 20 years and Tanner Ross was they could like I say they could rub a couple nickels together and make a million here's some of the early crews see what I was saying this is the whole staff they were only six guys that were volunteers in town and you can see that this is and this is the council behind them I'm assuming um, a little tidbit the 61 that's coming up in a second uh, it was signed for by Bruce's father and that engine the 61 was $22,000 in 1996 the last one that I signed for or the town signed for was almost a half a million dollars so when you see them driving down the road they have to last 20 years you know when you're paying a half a million dollars there's uh, Chief Heinrich. He came to Ross from Marin Ship Fire. He used to, he built fire engines and pickups and whatnot down there. I never knew the man. I know Bruce knew him. I was given his um, retirement bell when I retired. So I, I can't really talk too much about him. But uh, strikes a handsome pose, doesn't he? Looks like something out of Hollywood. I always chew a cigar, that's what I understand. Yeah. He, did, he didn't smoke him, he ate him. <laughs> so. Anyway, Charlie Penza, I kind of came on almost on the tails of this guy. This is, is the staff's favorite picture because look at him. Look how he looks pretty tired. Uh, skinny dude, his Ike jacket is right there. Um, anyway, we used to call this did we get to 2% at 90 retirement yet? <laughs> <laughs> so, Town of Ross was the last uh, community to grant the modern day retirement to their firefighters. The very last one. Ann was, I think Ann, you were one of, on that council that moved us into the real world. And there's the Van Pelt, which uh, right before I retired, a guy called me from Santa Cruz and said, are you interested in it? I sold it to a guy in LA, he's trying to give it back to me. Um, when we sold that one, after we sold that one in 96, I think, um, we got five, no, $800 for that one. Basically scrap at that point. And they not, as you can imagine in Ross, no road miles on them, but thousands of hours of pump time. So. I put the alarm clock dispatch up there once again to talk to the thriftiness of the town of Ross. They didn't buy into the county dispatch system till the mid 80s. And so how did we know what time the dispatch was? And I'll talk a little bit about even how we answered the dispatches. When you pulled out, there was a plug into the ceiling. The plug unplugged, obviously, as you're driving away. And the alarm clock that was there stopped. So that's when you know you left the firehouse. Now the rest of it, we just, we made it up. Well, it must have taken about three minutes to get there. And so, and that was one person staffing all the, for years and years and years. Um, Bruce and I started in 81. Uh, we got hired because the then fire chief had some health issues and they wanted a second person on. We were paid $75 for a 24-hour shift. That, that, that fire engine, is a, basically it's a convertible, as was all the previous engines, but that one was, was modern because it had windshield wipers on the inside the windshield as well as the outside, <laughs> which the previous engines didn't have. So it, it was a pleasure to drive this one in the rain because you had inside windshield wipers on the windshield. And when I say into the modern age, it, um, it, it was kind of state of the art, but like I said, it was twenty-two thousand dollars, and thrifty as they are, no power steering. That was probably an extra forty-two dollars. Um, anyway, when we used to answer the alarms up until '84, when when Marin County Dispatch started picking them up, wherever you were in the firehouse, there were red phones and a black phone. The black phone was just general, you know, anybody could call that one. The red phone was. 453-5500, if you guys are old enough to remember that. And when it would go off, it'd make you jump out of bed and you'd count. 
The third ring, everybody who was ever in the firehouse, volunteers, chiefs, whoever, one, two, Ross Fire Department, what's your emergency? And everybody would listen. And most of the time, the frequent flyers, we'd know them right away. Um, th at this point, we were still, I mean, it was the old Brown Estate, or it was Goebel's house, or it was all by names. And if you look in these logs, that's what I was talking about earlier, there's not a street number all the way through the 40s. You called up and you said who you were in the fire department, and once again, if you want to go look, there's still maps over there with just names on them. Of course, the street numbers came later, but um, one of the first things I got as an assignment in 1981 was to number streets because UPS couldn't find people. UPS didn't know the old Brown Estate or the Grandins. Or, <laughs> so as I was out going around doing these numbers, Lagnius Road went from 10 to 100 to 400 to 200 to 600. Well, and you can imagine people going back to tell people, you got to change these numbers. They say, why? You guys know where we're at. And also it costs money to change all your, all your paperwork. Imagine the deeds and everything that had to be done. So that was a struggle for a couple of years, but we did come into the modern age and guess what? Every house has got a number now and it makes some sense. Okay, this is some memorable fires. Um, the Ross guy there, in the, that's uh, Don Aaron's uncle. Uh, for uh, anybody that's been around the town of Ross any amount of time, <clears throat> you knew when those horns went off, you could go into that grocery store and you could probably clean out the till, you could get free beers, because these guys would drop out of that store and go man fire engines and go to work. So uh, this fire is the greenhouse. It uh, uh, would have been what's on DeWitt now, up on the top of the hill there. Um, <laughs> 68 was the year. I was still just a little pissant, but um, they, they lost the house, and as far as I know, it was never investigated. I heard today from Richard that there was a young couple in there doing whatever just prior to the fire. And, uh, it was in the process of being torn down. Yeah, and that's why it was always a little suspicious, I think, yeah. that hey, it's a lot easier to move ash than a house. Uh, another angle, see, they're, they're getting it now. They almost have it. <laughs> see, it's progressing pretty good. Well, let's get it all the way to the ground. Here we go. This one's an interesting story. It's um, not one that the fire department would care to tell you, but I put it in here for a reason. And once again, think names instead of numbers and everything else, and it'll make sense. At the time of this fire, this is Upper Road, and the resident's name is McAndrew. Um, there was also McAndrew on Canyon Road. Guess where the fire department went to? They went to Canyon Road first and went, well, there's nothing going on here. Well, then when you look up on the ridge, and sure, <laughs> there you go. So another, another great save. Um, you'll, notice, you'll notice the foundations are all okay. We, kept, we saved all those. That was 1959, I was just two years old, almost in Ross. Um, this is the Lil House on, on 4th of July. Anybody know who's in front? Roy Farrington-Jones. Roy Farrington-Jones, who I thought was gonna be here today. He photographed just about, I don't know how many years of, of fires and whatnot. He was the official photographer for the fire department. That, and that was a, a, hard, a difficult time for the fire department to get there, because that was, the 4th of July, which was uh, at the Marin Art and Garden Center, they're still having the Marin County Fair at that time. And you'd have cars parked on both sides of Lagunitas, and most of the streets were gridlocked with cars that time of year during the fair. And that's one of the things that finally got the fair out of town is, um, was, you know, because the town, you know, you couldn't really get around because there was just so much traffic in town at the time. Yeah, and Bruce, you were in Detroit for that fire? No, I was, I, luckily I was in New Jersey because my name was brought up as possible suspect. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we live next door, but I was in New Jersey that time. The one thing about fire guys, you know what? We can sometimes not get them out so easy, but we can't always light them. I'll attest to that last night. I took all the hair off my arm 
I was a little impatient with the uh, fire pit, so I splashed it with a little acetone. So, you know, we make mistakes too. Uh, I think this is Gloria, one of Gloria Ladd's fires. She had multiple, I think three that I know of. Um, Hodel was another one. It seemed that every house they were in burned down. So like I say, these are all good saves. The other thing about that, you know, is you go back and you look at the old log books and there's, there was virtually no investigation ever. If it wasn't real obvious, it just happened. You wrote it down and I guess the insurance companies paid it. You know, in this day and age, a fire like this would drag out a county team and they'd find the source and keep going. Um, much simpler time, my theory always was you know, we had a lot of good fires, especially when in the early 70s, it seemed like we had one. Sometimes we get a, a run where there's one a month. And I think it was kind of urban renewal myself. Uh, it was a lot cheaper to get rid of these and put them back up than, than to tear them down. Now, once again, I wouldn't say that in the court of law, but, you know. Anyway, this is a guy who I spent all, you know, I learned more from this gentleman than anybody I think in my life other than my father. Very, very innovative guy. He was a great mechanic. He could roll under a fire engine, look at something, go back in his shop, bend it five different ways, walk back and put it under there and be done with it. While I'm thinking about that, we have Louie back here who's 100 years old who used to work on Canyon Road. These sirens right here were made on Canyon Road originally. I forgot him, there he is. He, his claim to fame, and I haven't seen it, but the, he's on film or telling about it. He could take one apart and put it back together with his eyes closed. Anyway, back to Tom Kassim. Um, Bruce and I, we could tell you a lot of stories about this guy. Some of them, at one point he wanted both of us out of his firehouse and <laughs> don't come back. Um, but honestly, uh, incredibly unique guy. Um, he had the talent to do anything. On his days off, he built fire boats. He built ambulances. Where's Dan? There, back there, Dan owned Bay City's uh, ambulance for a long time. So there was always something, and his, his claim to fame for me was, and he got in trouble for it a couple times, if you wanted to work on your car, the town of Ross bought your parts. You know, and for young guys with broken down cars all the time, it was a good deal. But the, why he did it was because he'd have people around. They'd be there working on their cars, so guess what? He wasn't going out alone. Um, I, it's, where's Doug sitting? Doug Moore will tell you a story in a second here. He, well, I'll let you tell the story. He, uh, kind of, as you know, growing up in this town, the, the town originally were small homes that were summer homes before the bridge was built. And so none of the homes had air conditioning or uh, insulation. And um, there was a fire on uh, Allen, 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 and um, uh, it was a pretty good fire, did pretty good uh, damage. And they had, um, people retrofitted their houses with insulation. And, and one way you did it was my client, uh, Certainty, out of uh, uh, Atlanta had paper and they'd blow the paper in and compact it so that it would insulate the wall. And so I got a call from the general counsel of, of Certainty and to assign a case to us. And he said that uh, there's this uh, little put on town with this little dumb shit fire chief that says <laughs> that our insulation burns and supports uh, flam it's flammable. And it's been, we, we put it through the UL labs and it, it doesn't burn. And so we, we took uh, Tom's deposition over at the fire station and um, he, I, I said, well, this paper UL approved, it couldn't support a fire. And he said, well, that, sir, was before they blew it into the wall because when they blew it into the wall, the paper would break down and it would uh, support uh, a fire. And so the company had to recall that product from all over the United States. And I was telling Peach the other day, 
when, when he said, it's Podunk Town of Ross, I said, well, I happen to live there. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a really a bright guy. And, uh, How here, many millions of dollars did that cost that company? Yeah. yeah, he was, I mean, he, he had one of those brains where he'd think it through, and, and he'd always come up with the right thing. Um, he was a little bit uh, old-fashioned with the volunteers. He didn't want to ever put them in harm's way, so he surrounded and drowned a lot of fires. Uh, I recall on, up on Winship one day, I w it was Christmas morning, and I was back from school, and the horn's going off, and my dad, it's across the street, Tom, get going, you know? And so I'm, Christmas Eve, you can only imagine what Tom was doing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I go over there and I go in the house prior to the fire engine arriving and I get, I hand the kid to John Ongro and, and anyway, that all worked out great. But I go upstairs because it was just a Christmas tree fire and it was a big tall ceiling and so it was basically out. I went upstairs to open the windows and Tom Casson, his first thing was put that truck in pump and set the brakes and wheel the... <laughs> the Stang monitor, the big uh, water cannon, and I opened the, and here he's got to point it right at me, and I'm, no, no, don't do it. So, uh, but you know what, he, he was a unique guy, uh, could be a little grumpy, as some of the council people here will tell you. Um, it turned out he, he had some heart issues, and that's why, you know, he'd run, run up six, seven flights of stairs, and he'd be pumping 60, you know, beats a minute, so. Anyway, once he got that corrected, he was like a new guy. Anyway, his fireboats ended up, uh, most of them were sold to Aramico uh, in the Saudi Arabia area. Uh, very talented guy. He, in, he patented a couple of things that are, were on those fireboats. Um, he was only there about 10 years, and this is where it all gets interesting, and I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Um, let's just go. This is 70s and 80s. We really had a good crew of volunteers. We, you know, I, the volunteers in here will remember some of those softball games and stuff were crazy. Uh, wouldn't it happen today just because of the workman's comp claims? Uh, a lot more training and some of it, you know, a lot more interior stuff and more medical training. Uh, then uh, ISO came to town and said, because Tom Casson didn't like, wouldn't wine and dine the ISO guy, our rating went to a nine and uh, the council kind of panicked and said, what are we going to do? So in came public safety. And talk about beating a dead horse. The town threw more money at public safety. Oh, we'll cross train everybody. Oh, the cops will be firemen. Well, uh, the guy they hired to do it, Roger Shuto, most of you probably remember him, this guy could sell ice to Eskimos. And then he'd sell them the freezers, too. So, <laughs> He, he snowed the ISO. Um, we all of a sudden got a ladder truck. And the ladder truck was, geez, it looks like a, the old pickup truck. So all he did was throw all kinds of ladders on it, exhaust fans, uh, and called it a, a ladder truck. And anyway, he got him to keep the rating at five. I don't know how he did all that. But he also was the one that just kept beating the, oh, yeah, we're going to get everybody trained. Bill Ells back here, he was one of the trainers, he used to come in and, and spend a lot of time with the police officers, and police and fire guys are like oil and water, you know, they just don't really blend. The only time, you know, they all hate the fire guys because we take their wives from them, and, uh, <laughs> and, and we used to always tell them, you guys filled out the wrong application, that's you know, what's your only problem. <laughs> You guys, a quick joke. You know, you know the only, there's two professions in the world where you can make money lying on your back, right? <laughs> right? Fire, firemen and ladies of the evening. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, back to the community part of this whole talk. Um, about 1983, there was an attempt by Ross Valley to uh, take over. Now keep all this in mind because look up, look where we ended, you know. Um, to take it over and uh, anyway there were people in the audience that night who stood up and one of them being Bob Ford took out his checkbook from his back pocket waved it at the council and said how much do you want? What do you, what do you want to keep our fire department how it is? 
And this was the uh, cartoon the next day in the IJ. You know, that was some party last night. We are getting a new fire truck, uh, new tax, uh, $1,000 per parcel. Pretty good sized tax. And it's carried, I think it's only failed once. I, didn't it fail once here recently when I wasn't around? <laughs> anyway, um, that's when, when we really did start getting updated. They spent a lot of money on equipment and personnel started getting better too. Didn't spend any on the firehouse. The firehouse is just falling down. And then this was the one we had made that actually fit in that front bay. Uh, and <laughs> When it arrived, we were backing it in, and, and we physically had to pull the mirrors in because it wouldn't fit in. That's how tight it was. And that's, once again, you know, when you're trying to build something to something that's antiquated, it doesn't work so good. You, you know, it should have been the other way around. Fix the firehouse first. This is our cops. You remember that, Ann? Delia Eiler. She used to put out these newsletters, and this was when the, it first arrived. By the way, one of the ugliest fire engines ever built. Um, this was a Roger Shuto deal. He, uh, somebody was building something, I forget who it was, or selling something on the Upper Road West. He says, well, you've got to give us some fire protection. So all of a sudden, we've got uh, this Peterbilt that was redone by, really nice. It was a beautiful water tender. But it had a 13-speed road ranger in it that nobody could drive. <laughs> so then, you know, here comes another training issue, and only certain people can drive it. And I ended up selling that to Lake Shasta Fire Protection District. Um, this was real quick. You know, you can see it. This is when we really started to gear up staffing. And in <clears throat> 2003, the ISO came back to town. And because of our staffing changes, we went to a four which doesn't help residential rates much, but it was a real feather in my cap, and the then chief, who uh, is now your undersheriff, uh, didn't even get what, we were, what it was all about. Um, he was, you know, once again, oil and water, they just didn't get it, um, and they didn't care. So when we merged, um, Ross Valley Fire was a three, and they've recently been re-rated to a two, so you should see some reduction in your insurance in the near future. Insurance Services Office, it's just a, an agency that rates public agencies. So um, that was quite a deal. Uh, the Apprentice Firefighter Program went away because I, once again, a discussion in the firehouse this morning when I arrived early. Um, that people didn't get it. They thought, oh, it's just extra bodies. No, it was the third person on the engine, and we had three paid guys, and it cost about 108000 a year, and they didn't see the value in it and stopped paying for it. Um, Roger, you want to, uh, where's Roger Meager? Okay, um, this, we'll spend a few minutes on the merger. I'm trying to get this done on time. So full circle, here we come again. Um, come on up, Roger. Um, I don't know how many attempts in this valley there were to put agencies together. And we tried Kentfield, Larkspur, Court of Madera. That was going to be the Court of Malarkfield Fire Department. <laughs> and we tried one. There was a shot by Chief Groshan, rough as it was. What was that, about 2000? 2003. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was one where we thought, well, we'll just do it with Kent Field. Anyway, you can only imagine the politics, number one. Start with the personnel. Everybody's making different money. Everybody's in different retirement uh, amounts. Just the logistics was crazy. And then throw in elected bodies. You know, personnel mainly was <laughs> some of the biggest battle. Anyway. When they made me chief, I knew when I was going to retire, roughly. And I made one more stab with Roger. I said, you want to try it one more time and see if we can push this thing through? And Roger, well, I won't say graciously, but took the challenge on. And the two of us, well, jump in whenever you want. It was four different elected boards, 
four different attorneys at one point. We managed to get that down to a couple attorneys. Uh, two different contracts and a public perception. Why are, why are we losing our fire department? So uh, I caught a, a little bit of grief, but mostly people, when they heard and listened to what they were going to get out of it, they saw the benefit in it. And have at it. You, no. You all right? Yeah. All right. Um, so that was, that was uh, what did we start? We started in 2010. And we had Scott Hunter, who I'm sure a lot of you know. He was very instrumental in staying the course with us, um, council-wise and everything else. Um, when Gary Broad left, I thought, oh, here we go. We're gonna, this isn't going to happen because he was pretty helpful in you know, at least keeping the council interested. Um, then came the selling point to town of San Somo, town of Fairfax, Sleepy Hollow Fire Protection District, because here come the new kids on the block. Uh, Ross has got money, so there was debate on what's the percentages, who pays what, and I don't know how many hours <laughs> just put together trying to figure it out. Poor Roger here, he, uh, he came in with a set of numbers for the council, when, the Ross Council. Uh, what were you off? You are off 5,000 bucks or something? And anyway, he felt so bad, and I said, Roger, we're talking about a, a million eight. You know, 5,000, we'll talk our way out of $5,000. <laughs> anyway, it did all come together. Um, uh, July 1st, 2012 was the first day uh, where there was no more, quote, Town of Ross Fire Department. But we, as we tried to explain to people, you still have your fire department. It's in your community. You're going to dictate something or whatever you want to pay for and do. So you're not losing a fire department. You're gaining a whole lot more personnel and fire engines. And I, I guarantee you when they start seeing that uh, insurance break at uh, class two, they're going to go, ah. Quick story, and I, you know, I don't mean to totally bang on the town of Ross, but this one, recently they paid $50,000 a year after I left two years after I left, to the council was convinced they weren't getting their money's worth and was thinking about pulling out of Ross Valley Fire. They paid $50,000 for a consultant. Anybody ever hear the results of the, the consultant's work? I didn't think so. Um, nobody ever found out what that guy said. But it was whatever he said, obviously, was what we told them because... 50,000 went away. If, it, if it, they had anything to talk about, they would have said, oh, we got snowed by Tom and Roger. Anyway, it's all working out. We've got a couple of Ross Valley guys in the back right now. They don't like working in the Ross Firehouse because uh, sleeping with rats is getting old. So if, if you've got a council person's ear, it's time. I mean, it's a beautiful building. Either spend a few bucks and save the front and build something modern, or best thing is probably bulldoze it and lift it out of the floodplain. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> one more real quick thing. 2005, you guys all remember what happened. Uh, it was another 500-year flood. I had three of those in my 30-year career. Um, when I got down from Windsor that morning, early, they had all the doors up on the, the, where the fire engines are in the back, and the water was coming through three foot high, right from the back doors to the front doors, picking up speed. Um, right after that, they got the trailers. Everybody, everybody's seen the trailers, still, one of them's still there. Um, and I, at the time, I said, it's 24,000 bucks, let's buy it. And they said, oh, no, 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 they won't be here that long. Well, in 2015, I went back jokingly, said, I'm, what are you doing here, Tom? I'm here for the 10th anniversary of the fire trailers you got out here. <laughs> And they, they said, what? Anyway, you can imagine how many times they've bought them. They've been paying $1,000 a month since 2005. So anyway, that's just something to keep in the back of your heads if you hear talk of remodels. I hope you support it. Um, that was my editorial for the... Anyway, 2012, July 1st, was uh, the start of Ross Valley Fire for Town of Ross. 
I worked for Roger one day, because July 2nd, I retired. <laughs> okay. And he never, he didn't give me a bonus or anything. I didn't even get a raise. So anyway, I'll take any questions you want. Um, there's people in here that could have, they have dirt on people. Everybody. Okay. Before you do that, I'll just Good. say a couple words on the merger. And Good. I think the key that, you know, Chief talked about that, you know, the previous attempts, it just the timing wasn't right. You know, the Ross Fire Department was still evolving with staffing. And when Tom became chief, he recognized it became the next logical way to go because even though he had a staff fire engine, he really didn't have command staff, anybody to, to take charge of a fire except for the fire chief. And if he wasn't around, there wasn't somebody to do that. So that's where our relationship again began. We provided battalion chiefs and uh, we worked to bring the merger together. And the one thing that we did do is we dotted our eyes across the T's and made sure that you know everybody knew what the, the merger was going to cost or save money in this case, how it was going to improve service. And um, I think you know the upgrading of the ISO number, which we figured would occur to at least a three at the time, and now it's uh, also a two, which, which does make a, di a difference. So um, you know, I handed it to Tom because it was his willingness, recognizing what was best for his community. Uh, knowing that he was going to retire to continue to advance the fire service. So if you look, you know, back to the early days, the volunteers, you know, everything they did, you know, to, to get the first fire protection in town before 1908, things just burned with, with no fire department. To today, when, when Tom retired, to that, that next level of having a larger organization that can, that can support the needs of the community when it comes to fire and EMS protection. So. Uh, a lot of credit needs to go for Tom to having that vision and, and moving the department forward yet again, as some of his predecessors have. So. Thanks. <laughs> Just a real quick, uh, the model we used to do this, we, we built it and sold it to the political bodies and everybody first. Um, once again, police and fire. Central Marin Police Authority, they, they kind of started, let's mix everybody up and start it. Well, guess whose paperwork and <laughs> model they used at the end? Why reinvent the wheel? The fire department already did it. So there's the Central Marin. It's basically the same model. It, it worked out. So anyway, any questions or comments or anything? Yeah, Bill. siren and a cam nozzle. The cam siren was probably one of the most dominating sirens in the United States. It was made here in Ross, up on the hill in a, where, a, a workshop next to us. This gentleman, Luis Olivini, is a hundred years old. He probably made that siren that you're looking at up on the desk. The word cam comes from the father of the engineer who built these. Conrad Adolf Musendorfer, who was a councilman here in Ross, his son went to Cal, Cal Calvin's here, and started making cam sirens and nozzles. This gentleman worked there in making them, and I'm sure he, with his eyes closed, he could walk up to that siren and take it apart and put it back together. <laughs> so I seen him do that. So I just need. This is a great piece of history right here. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, wasn't there a boundary in town? Isn't wasn't this nozzle made up on uh, Canyon Road? On Canyon Road, mm. and it was a boundary in the uh, I think it was the Olympic Yeah, it's uh, yeah, right on the shore right there. It, it used to be a barn, and now it's a very nice house. Anybody else? Tom, do you know who was the longest acting chief? Uh, Heinrich was there 24 years. I think, he, well, I can't speak to the real early ones. I found out today our first chief was Scott Murray. Something I, I mean, who knows? <laughs> One thing they weren't good about is keeping notes and records. And the, like I said, the three 500 year floods took care of a lot of, of the history of this town because it just wiped out everything. So 
note to whoever, put it up higher. The earliest records I have are about 1915, uh, you know, where there's actually rules and regulations and inventories and, you know, that's the earliest I know. I'm assuming, you know, that one of the big fires in this town was 1908 when the Lagnes Club burned to the ground. We're trying to do a story on that. The, the we're in, uh, fire group is trying to find the info on that. I think there was a lot of, you know, remember everybody came here, a lot of people came here after the 06 quake. So they've already seen fire and everything else. So I think that was some of the impetus to uh, incorporate. And, you know, they had a constable before that, but then they, that's all they had. And then all of a sudden in 1908, that's the earliest history anybody's got. And that's the first time that a picture I showed you that I've never seen that till a couple weeks ago. So everybody assumed it was 1910 because that's the year the engine was made. Well, I don't know that. I can't answer you. So, anybody else? For sale? Sure. <laughs> is it mine? Yeah. No, that belongs to the town of Ross, except for the bell. The bell is mine. Um, yeah, I'd like to find a home for all that. So because it's, it's a different, different group of people now who history isn't as important as you, everybody here wants it to be. So. So, so where are these things now? They are in cabinets and, in yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fire chief, or the police chief informed me if they didn't show back up, he's okay with that. <laughs> so it is. Just taking up room in his office. <laughs> Center. Were those actually used in Ross? No. Okay. Those were donated by the same guy who donated the map. Okay. Those are actually London buckets. London, okay. Yeah. It, what, what Tom Forcer's, it, Tom Forcer's ex-chief of Lucasfilm Fire. Um, we sent back two buckets that Bob Ford gave us from 1812 um, that were London fire buckets, <laughs> and they're on display in the National Fire Academy right now. So if you get back there, it's in Emmitsburg, Virginia. It's a pretty cool place. Anybody else? Uh oh. You know that great big piece of wood? That, that beautiful picture of all the mm -hmm. that you loved. At the very bottom, that looked like rotary emblems. Mm -hmm. Were they? Do you know what I'm talking about? The one that you said the picture looked so good. It's a big piece of wood. It had all these little uh, uh, decals. numbers and decals on them. And at the very bottom were two what looked like rotary. I just wondered if they were. I don't know. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> One of your early charts at the firehouse was on the corner of Lagunitas Road and Woodworth. Mm -hmm. I was standing under the workman that was changing the sign to Shady Lane. Oh, no. And the other one was Wordsworth, mm -hmm. not Woodworth. Right. Is that? That's, that's true. Word, Wordsworth was there for a while, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? You guys all have seen. We finally got all the street signs match. I guess that was something that one of the new town managers wanted to spend money on. Um, so what do you know? Here, a hundred years later, the streets are all the same. You know, and, yeah. there was it, when the firehouse was at that corner where the school is now. We had somewhere for years. We had the gong that rang the, the bells at St. John's. And I don't know if that was somebody roping it or if they had a system because there was a, some kind of gear wind on it. I don't know where that went. I mean, it was heavy, big thing. It's probably went a dumpster when somebody didn't realize what it was, but a giant mallet that swung and rang the church bells for the fire department. Anybody else? You bet. Thanks. <laughs>